All right, hello. Welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with this second episode of our three-part series, uh, following the theme of the elements, where we explore the elements most integral to the wine regions of New York State, earth, water, and of course, wine. So today we are focusing on water, exploring um, the different bodies of water and their impact on New York's growing regions. Um, many of you are tasting along with us. Um, so you've got the tasting kits with you. Um, and then I know most of you are webinar pros by now, but I will share a few housekeeping notes. Um, there are two communication methods available to participants. You have a chat section and then a Q&A section. So that chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with the other participants. We encourage you to do so. Um, but the Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. Uh, so the session uh, is being recorded and I'll go ahead and introduce our host. Uh, this is Jamie Good. Uh, Jamie is a London-based wine writer who is currently wine columnist with UK national newspaper, The Sunday Express. He is also the author of the book, Wine Science. As well as writing, he also lectures and judges wine. So joining Jamie is our panel. Um, we've got Fred Merwarth from Herman J. Weimer, Julia Hoyle from Cosmer Winery, and Miguel Martin from Nicole Wines. So over to you, Jamie. I'll let you go ahead and introduce the panel in more in depth. Hello. Um, so. I think this is a really exciting session and I love this theme of water. I think water is really interesting when it comes to viticulture. And also I'm really excited about these um, these six wines that we've got to try. Um, well, those of you who've got the kits are gonna be trying them as well, but I'm, I'm quite excited about that. Um, and um, Katie introduced our, our three panelists. Well, we've got Julia Hoyle, uh, Hosmer, and Julia has been making wine in the Finger Lakes since 2012. She started with um, Peter Bell, who's a sort of Finger Lakes legendary winemaker at Fox Run, and then she had a spell at Sheldrake Point before moving to Hosma. And we've got Fred Melwas, who's the um, winemaker owner at um, Herman J. Weimer, and he's been there since 2001, so 22 years at Weimer, one of the leading wineries in the Finger Lakes. And finally, Miguel Martin hails from Andalusia in Spain, and he's been working for 20 years now in Long Island, which is another of the key regions in New York State. And he's had spells at Palmer and Wolfer and is now at McCall Wines. Um, so um, really I'd wanted to start by kind of just looking at the importance of water. I and mean, if you think about oceans, you can think about lots of wine regions, particularly on, for instance, the, the west coast of, of North America and South America, where you've got the Pacific Ocean and the Humboldt current, current. So you've got a very cold ocean. Um, and the thing about water is that water is very, um, it has a kind of a, a, a thermal sort of buffering role. So it takes longer um, to heat up and it takes longer to cool down. So generally speaking, when you're near water, you think about the ocean, like the, the Pacific Ocean, you've got this very cool influence in the summer and it's bringing cold air and fogs and air currents in really affects um, the wine regions within the proximity of the ocean. And then we can think about island wineries and some fantastic wines coming from various islands like the Canary Islands or Madeira or the Azores, where if you look at the position of the islands, you think it's going to be too far south, too hot for viticulture. But again, that moderating effect of the ocean um, cools things down. It kind of, it kind of buffers things. Um, and that what we're going to be looking at now is we're going to be looking at two rather different sets of water. We're going to be looking at oceans when it comes to um, Long Island, and we're going to be looking at the effect of lakes moderating what otherwise is quite a severe continental climate. And when we're talking about the Finger Lakes, so if you look at Long Island down there, we've got um, the Atlantic Ocean, um, and that's the water body we're concerned with there. And when we look at the Finger Lakes, we've got those sort of like eleven lakes running sort of north to south um, and the deeper and bigger ones have quite a significant role in buffering temperatures in what otherwise would be quite an extreme continental climate. Um, so we'll be discussing that later. I'll be asking questions for the Finger Lakes winemakers about the just the specific role of those lakes in making viticulture possible. 
And if we look a bit further north, we see Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, and they're kind of interesting because if you think of them, you look, they look both look like really big lakes. But Lake Ontario is much, much deeper. And if you look at where Niagara is, you look at the Niagara Falls, and then we kind of go over to Canada, there's a major wine region there benefiting from Lake Ontario. And without that, it would be far too cold in the winter to grow Vitis vinifera, and it would be pretty cold for most of the hybrids. Um, but with Lake Erie, although there's a wine region there, that's a much shallower lake, and it just doesn't have the same sort of buffering capacity. It doesn't kind of, in the winter, that can get really cold and can freeze over, and therefore it's not that useful in keeping the winter lows up to a point that you can grow vinifera reliably. So you see the, 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 the lakes there are having a massive effect on viticulture. So I want to turn to you. So Julia, first of all, um, can you, you're on um, one of the, you're on Cayuga Lake, yeah? And yep. can you tell us a little bit about what that means in terms of viticulture and more specifically about, the, sorry, more generally for the whole region, you know, what those lakes are doing in terms yep. of shaping? And, yeah. Yes. And Fred, jump in as well um, if we want to connect Seneca. So Cayuga and Seneca are the two deepest finger lakes and we are benefiting from Ontario and Erie, but sort of coming back right close to the winery. Um, Cayuga Lake at its deepest point, I don't have the exact number, but it's about 150 meters deep. Um, it does not freeze over. The very top of the lake sort of rolls out into a marsh, so that will freeze every winter. Same with this, that south end, it will freeze down near Ithaca, um, right where Cornell University is. Um, but that middle section of the lake is very, very deep. Um, it will not freeze. Seneca Lake is the same. Seneca is what, about 180 meters deep, so a little bit deeper. Um, so as long as you're sort of planting for Cayuga around that heart, and Hosmer is right about where that heart is, um, we can grow hybrid native, of course, but we can also grow a fair bit of vinifera. And some of the first vinifera on Cayuga Lake was planted in the 70s, um, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. So. And um, so, Fred, you're on Seneca a bit deeper. Does that make a difference? Or once you get to that sort of depth, is it kind of um, pretty similar? I think it's pretty similar um, in um, the lake's um, ability to heat and cool and influence the shorelines. I think where both Seneca and Cayuga have a, another element of that, that interaction with the lake is as you get further south, you get higher in elevation, um, steeper hillsides down to the lake. And as you move further north, on both lakes, the, the land around the lake becomes um, much more gradual to the water. And so the interaction of, of the lake, how vineyards are currently planted um, is, is very different from south to north. And I think that has a, a huge influence. And we see that in our, the multiple vineyard sites that we have that are either sitting up fairly high off the lake that have maybe a more, um, uh, not as strong influence from the lake versus our, some of our northern vineyards that, that um, have a, a, a very strong influence from the lake because of a little bit lower in elevation and also proximity to, to the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that real fast, um, Seneca will have steeper slopes as well um, in most areas than Cayuga's steepest slopes. And they also help with water runoff to the lake. So we have a lot of underground water and it's a big help for water runoff and cold air runoff um, in the winter. And so you're both there's on, on the west side of the, the lake from those pictures. So are all your vineyards, Fred, on the west side as well? Just checking there. Uh, we have we have one vineyard, Standing Stone Vineyard, on the east side of the lake. And so that is, again, uh, you know, having uh, evolved and grown up, if you will, on the west side of the lake in terms of viticulture and winemaking. Um, and then to experience the east side of the lake since 2017, when we purchased Standing Stone, it is a very different place with very different interactions with the lake, um, both winter, summer, fall, the, the whole year long. So it's um, it's really interesting to compare and contrast east side to west what would, side. What would the differences be? Is, is there a consistent pattern from east to west? The west. 
Yeah, so um, on the east side, generally in the winter, you have a little bit um, warmer conditions, a little bit more airflow coming off the lake that are warming the, the, the spots. Um, um, that is kind of the biggest thing. Um, so if we see last winter, 2021 into 22 was one of the best examples, unfortunately, that we've, we've seen. We had conditions at our winery, uh, HAW, which sits up high on a plateau, uh, minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Standing stone at that same six hour period was only minus six and a half. And our northern vineyards, 10 miles north on the lake, um, were about minus seven and a half degrees. So, you know, that in, in those really cold experiences, that will hold true on almost every single cold event that we have. The other then is in the ripening period and, and the growing um, season and into the fall. The east side, generally, we're seeing lots of airflow, um, no matter what, especially early to late afternoon. Um, lots of airflow coming off the lake that dries things out. Um, so that's a that's certainly a benefit to, to the east side vineyards. The, the west side, this is off topic, but the west side does get the morning sun to dry things out earlier. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Another cool thing that will happen east versus west side more on Seneca is Seneca can have its own weather in the winter. We talk about lake effect snow from the Great Lakes and it will be sunny where I work in on Cuga Lake. And if I call over to someone that's in Hector, so the east side of Seneca Lake, there have been times where they have 10 centimeters of snow and it's just coming off of Seneca Lake because the lake is warm enough and the air is cold enough. And does proximity to the lake influence whether you can grow vinifera varieties or whether you have to turn towards the hybrids? I mean, and what sort of, I mean, how far can you go away from the lakes without, you know, risking winter damage? I'm presuming it's winter damage is the thing that, that limits the spread of vinifera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, as again, as you're further south and you have really steep hillsides coming off the lake, um, your proximity is critical because you are for for winter damage. Because as soon as you get up on the plateaus, it can get very cold, um, and we're talking um, 10, 15 degree Fahrenheit difference in those low temperatures um, at on this on the slopes on the water versus up on the plateaus. As you move further north and the land gets more um, less steep, um, you can you can talk about maybe a five to six degree change between the lake and those cold temperatures up on the hills. Um, and, and so, Jamie, to your point, also proximity to the lake um, in spring frost and your first frost of the season uh, can be the huge difference between growing certain vinifera, especially early budding vinifera um, or early ripening versus late ripening varieties, where as you get further away from the lake, um, on those northern sites, a little bit, the land is a little bit um, more gradual at the lake. You can only go um, about um, oh, 1,600 meters to 1,800 meters from the shore before you have spring frost or your first frost of the season. And so that is the limiting factor for, at least from the Tenerifera side, of what can be grown in that zone. And then to your point, getting too far off the lake. Yeah. Yeah. And we looked at the map earlier, we saw there were quite a few finger lakes. We talked about two of them. Um, so presumably is Cuca Lake, the, there are vineyards on Cuca Lake as well. Yeah, that, that looks kind of thinner and smaller. Yes. Yep. Um, Cuca, yeah. there's one or two on Canandaigua and Skin the Atlas, but they, they're pretty fringe come winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Cuca is sort of that heart, the bluff, that point sort of in the middle um, of the Y. That's one of the warmest areas. I don't have off the top of my head how deep Cuca is. I don't, Fred, I don't know if you know. Yeah, 56 but meters, I looked it up earlier. It's 56 meters yeah. deep. There we and go. Cayuga <laughs> is 133 and Seneca is 188. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the others, uh, just to add something, yeah. uh, just to add something about Cuca and, and a, a lot of the original, some of the original vineyards 
in the Finger Lakes, so she vinifera, are planted on Cuca. And there, there's a lot of um, older vineyards. There's a lot of new plantings going in on Cuca. Cuca does freeze, which is then a limiting factor to what you can grow off of the lake, how far you can get compared to, say, Seneca and Yuga, which don't freeze. And, and I mean, we always think about our viticulture being intrinsically linked to cold damage. So what is that cold te temperature in, in winter? Um, that's kind of dictates a lot what we do. Yeah. And are some varieties a bit more winter hardy, some vinifera varieties a bit more winter hardy than others? Does that affect where you plant the actual varieties themselves as well? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Vinifera wise, and I presume Fred is probably doing a similar thing. The colder areas of our vineyard, it is Riesling um, that we have planted and actually some Cabernet Franc. Uh, Chardonnay likes to be a little bit closer to the lake. So we let it be a little bit closer to the lake. <laughs> yeah. And while we're on the subject of water as well, um, what's water availability like, you know, in terms of the vine accessing water? I mean, how free draining the soils? How well do they retain water? What's the, the rainfall like in the average growing season? Yeah. So oh. water... We have a lot of drainage tile around our vineyard and that's pretty common. Uh, very few vineyards need irrigation. Some newer plantings are putting it in perhaps because their site requires it or just speculative looking forward to what climate change may or may not bring. Um, you know, oftentimes it's an issue of we have too much water. Um, it'd be nice if it drained a little better. <laughs> um, so yeah, water is no issue. Tend to be our vineyard, a bit more clay, shallow clay, um, some silty glacial till as well. So definitely a, a lot of water availability. <laughs> so. And Fred, you're, you're farming um, a lot of your vineyards organic meat now, yeah? So um, in terms of water availability, is, is disease pressure quite high, given that there's some growing season rainfall and that the, vin the vines can be a little bit vigorous? Um, yes, yeah, a, a, a couple of things. One, I wanted to just, uh, the question a little bit about, um, availability. I think we, we benefit in the Finger Lakes from having a, a huge range of soils from one vineyard site to another. And so the, the, the variation in soils, um, as Julie, uh, mentioned influences the water holding capacity tremendously. So one site to another site, one site lake to another, um, you can have very different water holding capacities and, and therefore different requirements in terms of uh, drainage versus not drainage, possible irrigation versus not irrigation. Um, generally, for vineyards that we're farming, we have one site, our HAW, which has very shallow topsoils. Um, they drain okay, but um, when they dry out, they they dry out. They are they are bone dry soils. Um, we've never irrigated. I don't have the intention of irrigating. You, we just adapt our farming and our viticulture around that versus our vineyards 10 miles north, which are much deeper, um, greater water holding capacity. Um, in our driest seasons, those vines continue to do very well. And that's just a factor of, you know, how deep the soil is and their, and their capacity for holding, holding that moisture. Um, that does both of those scenarios actually do pose a challenge for, for winter injury. As, as you mentioned, our northern vineyards can be more vigorous, and therefore having that vigor going into winter um, can create challenges if we're not careful with our pruning, our tying, our crop load. Um, our southern vineyards at HAW, um, where we have shallow topsoils, um, again, the vines can be stressed, especially coming out of a dry season where um they, they don't have the growth or the or the the power to to withstand very cold temperatures so um th there there are different factors there um just based around their water availability great well let's move to miguel miguel i'm sorry we neglected you talking about uh, um now we're moving not terribly far in terms of distance, but we're moving to a region that's quite different in terms of the influence of the water bodies. Could you introduce the um, the wine growing areas of Long Island to us? Um, sure. 
Um, Long Island, um, well, the first uh, vines uh, were planted in 1973 by Louisa Hargrave. Um, at that time, um, and a good friend of Louisa, and she was telling me that uh, she was having a hard time getting some funds from the banks uh, in order to plant grapes because they, um, there was no history of growing grapes or vines uh, in Long Island. So she was going to the banks and uh, asking for money and said, you must be crazy. Uh, Long Island is only for potatoes and corn and you are coming here uh, asking for money to plant a, a vineyard. So uh, 50 years later, uh, now the, we have about 3,000 acres of grapes uh, planted in Long Island. Uh, mostly uh, about a third, per a third percent will be Chardonnay and another third Merlot. Those are the main two grapes growing in Long Island. And there's about 50 different wineries um, in Long Island. So um, believe it or not, now there is a, there is a um, different uh, viticulture areas and, and, and section of Long Island. And we separate from the North Fork to the South Fork. Um, Long Island, like the name says, is, is a very long, long uh, island. It's about 120 uh, miles from New York City all the way to the end of the Long Island. And about 90 miles from New York City, uh, it splits in two forks, in the North Fork and the South Fork. Uh, my tall wines are uh, situated in the North Fork. As you can see in this map, uh, we are in the buffer between uh, uh, Connecticut and uh, New York. Um, so we are in a very um, strategic uh, sit, uh, position Then we are surrounded by water. Uh, and uh, in the north, where, uh, where in the north we have the sound and the, in the south uh, we have the Atlantic uh, maritime influence. So what's the climate like? Oh, sorry, yeah, carry on. You've got this picture now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, our geography is, uh, well, Long Island was uh, from the, uh, established by the uh, Wisconsin glaciers uh, about 10,000 years ago, uh, where soils are uh, not, they are thin, um, you know, about six to uh, 36 inches. Uh, and you can find sand, uh, slit, uh, clay, gravel, very uh, good drainage, uh, and it's fairly flat. Uh, we have some moderate plains, but uh, mostly on Long Island is pretty flat, uh, very consistent on, on the weather. Uh, and this type of soil creates a great drainage, uh, uh, moderate uh, water holding. Uh, you know, the rain and the water percolates very fast and quickly. So there's uh, uh, not too much of water retention. Uh, and sometimes uh, if you have a fairly dry summer, it could cause some vines to stress on, um, and they can sometimes, uh, um, depending on the weather, it can delay or move ahead uh, the harvest. Um, so, um, so it sounds like it's, you know, with all that water around, you're moderating the summer temperatures, you're keeping the winters warm enough that you don't have to worry about the vines being damaged by cold. Um, are there any drawbacks from having all that water around? Uh, you end well, up with... well the, uh, I will, uh, speaking of good things, uh, you know, having that water kind of create moderate uh, growing season, um, you know, nice and hot summers. And the temperature at night, it can fluctuate almost 20 degrees. So, uh, and the vines love that break on the temperature, you know, having that extreme hot of 85, uh, 90 degrees and going down to 65, 70 degrees at night. It really helps to uh, get that break to the vines to kind of uh, catch up with the heat and get uh, through the day and uh, extend the growing season much longer. Uh, or growing season is pretty much similar than you will spend in, in Bordeaux, um, you know, um, and that really uh, helps to retain all the aromatics, uh, moderate uh, uh, acidity uh, or soils also, they, uh, because it has so much uh, uh, gravel and slate, um, they are fairly uh, acid, the pH of the soils range between 4.5 to 5. 
And um, so sometimes uh, in order to uh, uh, increase the, the uh, more the uh, intensity of, of, of the wines that create uh, that uh, with the balance with the, with the grapes. Um, some of the issues that we have, uh, if we have a summer um, that is fairly wet, which we could have, uh, create some problems with botrytis uh, down in mildew. Uh, so that's why uh, I always say that we do the manicure and the pedicure of the vines. Uh, we do a lot of leaf removal by hand in order to um, alleviate the humidity that sometimes they can trap the extra rain that we get. Um, we do leaf removal, plaster thinning, um, low yield uh, in order to intensify the aroma profile on the vines. Um, yep. So just there's some questions in the Q&A that I wanted to look. Oh, they've been answered. Um, there's just one that's not been oh yeah they've been answered so the open question we have at the moment is from patricia says does the diurnal swing help with longer ripening or not really also do you get autumn rains like in bordeaux or not really uh yeah we do uh plenty of rain and um if we get a summer than uh, like last year last year was fairly dry and i was checking with uh, the bordeaux uh numbers and and the time that they picked the grapes. And they were very similar than when uh, we picked the grapes. Uh, we start usually first week in September uh, for sparkling wines. Uh, we can pick all the way until the end of October or the third week in October, uh, which is very similar to uh, Bordeaux. Um, so um, yeah. Great. Right, so I think now, um, we need to start looking at the wines. Um, so um, could we start, Julia, with your Hosmer Winery Chardonnay 2021? And first of all, could you give us a quick introduction to the winery uh, and then introduce this wine? Sure. So Hosmer Winery is one of the oldest on Cayuga Lake, started out as a vineyard. Um, so Cameron Hosmer and his father um, they put in the first vines along with Marin Hosmer in the late 60s, early 70s. First plantings were hybrid and native grapes. Um, but then in 1978, the first Chardonnay went into the ground. We still work with that. And 1980, 1981, the first Riesling. The winery itself was started in 1985. Um, and that there's a big sort of change in the industry in the 80s as the great market crashed. A lot of growers got stuck saying, do I sell the farm or do I learn to make wine? Um, and the Hosmers were of that class and they said, we're gonna learn to make wine. So um, the winery uh, is younger than the vineyard. The vineyard just turned 50 years old. Um, and I have been with the Hosmer family since 2017. And we're a pretty exciting crew. Tim Hosmer is the next generation and he's just a couple years older than I am. He primarily runs the vineyard and then I primarily run the winery and we work very closely together. So it's a lot of fun energy um, and just sort of a good crew of people. And the Chardonnay? The Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay is actually uh, about 70% from those first older vines. Um, it is almost all stainless steel. I There's a little bit of oak in there about 5% um, barrel fermented, barrel aged, but everything else would be stainless steel. So fresh style. Um, we cold soaked about half of the fruit um, before pressing off just to build in some roundness, some texture. And uh, yeah, uh, this is one of our staple wines. Our stainless very, steel. Very night. affordable as well. Yeah. 18 bucks. Yep. That's um, yep. really good. Yeah. Um, one question I noticed on the, the bottles, we've got a um, 12 and a half alcohol, so nice, modest alcohol. Um, acidity, six grams liter, that's a nice level, but the pH is, seems to be a little bit high at 3.66. Yep. So, so some of what, what's causing pH at what's actually a very normal acidity for a, for a Chardonnay? Sorry, you cut out a little bit. I missed. So you've got a, a normal level of TA, Yep. but you've got quite a high pH. Is there an explanation for that? So some of that does come down to 
cold soaking the fruit. I always, if I'm going to do that, I will always see a pretty steady pH jump in certain varietals and Chardonnay is one of them. Some of it's vintage as well. Uh, 2021 was a wetter vintage, but acids were not particularly high. We had a fair number of warmer nights, um, at least on our site. I noticed across the board that acid was relatively low uh, for what I would expect because a typical Chardonnay TA for me would be more in the range of seven and a half to eight. Um, so even that's a little bit low um, for our average. Yep. Um, do you have any malolactic fermentation in this? A little bit. A little bit. Um, the barrel components start um, and one of my stainless steel components did complete malolactic uh, but about 80% would have been no malolactic stainless steel. It's got a lovely mouthfeel. It's very textural. Yeah, very, very fruit driven, you know, um, really, really impressive. Um, more generally, Chardonnay in the Finger Lakes, is that a, is that a growing story? It is. Um, I think on two directions. One is sparkling wine production. Uh, it certainly the history of the Finger Lakes is rooted in sparkling wine production way back, um, but there's renewed interest both from making sparkling wines, but people want to buy them and they're willing to pay what it does cost to make a traditional method sparkling wine. So Chardonnay is a key component there. Um, and I also, you know, it's not quite as winter hardy as Riesling, but it does well. And it grows really well in the region and ripens really well. Um, and we can make these relatively, you know, good acid backbone, but fruity expressions of Chardonnay. Um, so it's very distinct from our flagship of Riesling, but it has a nice alternative. And I think a lot of people purchasing wine as well are interested in that. Yeah, that's great. Super. Um, so do share how you've, you experience that wine in the chat, or if you've got any questions, pop a question in the Q and A. Um, yeah, I, I really, really like that that purity and texture that wine's got. Really, really, really impressive. Um, so for the second wine, um, Fred, we're we're turning to you. Could you give us a little introduction to Wima and the story behind that, um, and then introduce this wine? Absolutely. Um, so um, the winery was started by Herman Weimer um, in 1973. Um, Herman came to the Finger Lakes in 1968 um, um, from a, a long tradition of making a, a winemaking family in the Mosul. Um, first plantings in Central Lake were 1974. Um, really as experimental, he put in about six acres um, as he was still working for another winery, the first full-on plantings, about 22 acres, were planted in 1977, 1978, uh, with Riesling, Chardonnay, Gamay, Pinot Noir, Givert Struminer. Um, and some of those plantings are still in production. The big Riesling block and big Chardonnay block are still in production today. Um, I started with Herman in 2001, as you had mentioned, and took over the winery in 2007 um, from Herman after training under him um, for six years. And it was our business partner, Oscar, and my wife, Marisa, and I who took over the reins um, and continue to run the winery today. When we took over, we had 63 and a half acres. We have 135 acres now that we own and 45 acres, an additional 45 acres that we, we manage um, on seven different vineyard sites uh, with 100% um, vinifera um, on our own acreage. Um, so the wines that we have, um, we have two wines, the, the Bio Riesling 2018 and the 2021 Late Harvest. The Bio wine um, is our first uh, vineyard block that we moved into biodynamic farming in 2015. Um, it's at the original vineyard site, HJW Vineyards. Um, this block was planted in 2009. Um, 
It's a combination of SO4 and 3309 rootstocks. It's on some of the deeper soils on this site. Uh, 2018 was a bit of a challenge in, in August. Um, the season was fairly nice coming into August, and then we had rain after rain after rain, very intense rains. Um, we're talking four to five inches of rain. Um, I think we had four rains of four to five inches on each each uh, experience. And it, it led to a harvest that um, we had experienced in 2013. We'd experienced it similar in, I would say, 2006. Um, but this was slightly different because of the intensity of the rain and the amount of it. Um, the HAW site sitting more southerly on, on the lake um, took on a lot more moisture than the northern vineyards. Um, so this, this site in particular, um, we were farming the rest of the HAW, HAW vineyard site organically. And this was the only block that we were farming biodynamically. And we lost a lot of fruit on our main vineyards there that were farmed organically. But the biodynamic block, this wine produced at full, full production in 2018, which was absolutely fascinating. Knowing the conditions, how fruit did not want to stay in the vineyards very long on our older plants, on the, on the younger vines that we were farming organically, the biodynamic fruit was phenomenal on this, on this block. Um, and so um, we did two picks, um, uh, kind of a, a mid-season pick and a later season pick on the bio. Um, part of the wine, the early picks were all stainless steel. The later pick was in large um, thousand liter barrels. Um, everything that we do is all natural fermentation. So things finish at different times. The stainless steel finish very quickly. The barrels finish fairly slowly. Fairly slowly for us can be um, April, May. These finished in June in 2019, finished fermenting in June. Um, what we did then was um, figure out what, what the blend of the early pick and the late pick, blend, blend them together, put them in barrel for a month, and then ended up bottling, bottling that wine. So this is the 2018 bio Riesling. It's got a beautiful aromatic intensity to it. I think the thing is when we haven't lived through the vintage, you know, when you have a difficult vintage, if you're a winemaker experiencing a difficult vintage, I wonder whether that has a shadow effect when it comes to looking at the wines later. Because it's like, even you, you know, when we come, we haven't experienced the vintage, so we can just look at the wine and go, wow, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. But when you've lived through a difficult vintage, maybe you're kind of emotionally a little bit scarred by that, that vintage experience. And so then it... Mm -hmm affects how then you see the wines afterwards um but this is this just seems beautiful i mean it doesn't seem like um there's anything difficult about this wine there's no sort of you know I, but the other thing is that i'm fascinated by this difference between the organic and biodynamic farming because presumably the the main difference between the organic and biodynamic will be the use of preparations um and perhaps the the preparations are are acting as elicitors of plant defense in some way. You know, the you know, the the the, the first phase of defense is this sort of like act activation of the um the plant's innate defenses that often is caused by you know pathogen the plant pathogen. but if the elicitors are kind of triggering those receptors and, and kicking in the defenses so they're getting you know synthesizing more molecules getting thicker cell walls and everything maybe that's the difference between the organic block and the biodynamic block, in the sense that you've got you've got a, some, a vine that naturally is a little bit more prepared and a bit more resilient because of those treatments prior to the the rain events. Yeah, it 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 was it was eye opening to see this happen, especially in real time as you're walking through a vintage, to see farming method be. I mean, it it not surprising in that way, but to see it on the same site in the same conditions with very slightly different farming methods, not totally different, just slightly different. Um, it, you know, we, we did a lot of soul searching afterwards, and we also did a lot of just what was that moment or what was that preparation or what was that spray where allowed the bio block to, to move forward 
and allowed the other blocks or created chaos in the other blocks. It actually came down, we had problems with black rot, um, which can be just devastating. Um, and it came down to the preparation using horsetail versus relying on um, within the organic sprays. Um, copper is one of the main, still one of the main effective deterrents of black rot, but it's it's only to a point. It's only to a point in, in the severity of the infection. And so copper did not work in here while horsetail did the horsetail preparation and, and tea spray mm. is what we we kind of had to to take away as our as our uh, kind of the ace in the hole, if you will, to to solve that. So after this vintage, we moved the entire farm away from organic and in, into fully biodynamic farming. So we're at 33 acres now on this site of, of biodynamic wow. farming. Well, that's, yeah, quite impressive. Yeah. And so th you there was a question before about um, botrytis, and I think we'll get to it on this next line. That was also an interesting thing on the 2018 was that there, the 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 botrytis um, uh, the 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 onset of botrytis was very late in this block. Um, and I think to your point of thicker skins, more durable skins versus some of our northern vineyards that had less rain but started to deteriorate in terms of botrytis. We saw that much greater on on other vineyard blocks that, than this biodynamic block. So let's move to the late harvest Riesling. Um, this is 21. Um, what can you tell us about this? So 21 is, um, I, I, I had a, um, I'm not going to miss, miss words. 21 was the most difficult vintage that I've experienced. And I would argue to Herman that it was the most difficult vintage that we've experienced in a long time in the Finger Lakes. Um, again, all based around rain and continuing moisture. And, and Julia really alluded to it earlier in, on the 21 Chardonnay was um, it was it was overall a wet year. The sites in the Finger Lakes from north, south, east, west all just had totally different experiences. Um, but what we noticed on on this was a little bit higher um, pH, a little bit lower uh, TA, and that a lot of that I can attribute to what Miguel was saying was just warmer nights, where in the Finger Lakes, we can typically rely on having you know nice warm days, August, September into the ripening period, and then a really defined cooling down at night, which helps retain lots of our natural acidity. In 21, we, we didn't have that. So Botrytis went pretty rampant in 21. Um, typically for, for us with late harvest, I try to keep it very clean of, of botrytis. I have we have other wines and ways that we work with botrytis in, in all of our different Riesling blocks. Um, but this does have some botrytis. Um, I get that on the on the a little bit on the aroma, but then also seeing that that TA and that um, come down and that um, the pH up just a little bit. It's about three two pH, whereas a lot of our late harvests can be in the three to three one. Um, this is a blend of three of our vineyard sites, the HJW site, Yosef and Magdalena. Yosef and Magdalena are, are, are 10 miles north of the winery. Um, they are inherently riper sites. Oh, watching these vineyards now for 20 plus years, we can expect 10 to 14 days greater ripening at our northern vineyards. And typically that's where I'll take the late harvest reasons from. Um, most about 60% of this wine is based around our, our Yosef Vineyard site, plantings from 1977, 1978. Um, everything's handpicked, selected for ripeness and botrytis. Botrytis typically will go for BAs and TBAs. So. It's beautiful, lovely wine, really precise, lovely acid line, beautiful tension between the sweetness and the acidity. Really wouldn't know it's from a tricky vintage, I think. It's just yeah. a really really lovely um and then um interest of time let's move on now and we're going to stick with the finger lakes um we'll come to you miguel in just a moment um but um julia 
another of your wines and we are hitting Cabernet Franc in yep. 2021. What can you tell us about this? All right. So this particular Cabernet Franc is, it's more of our entry level Cabernet Franc. It is made to be a light bodied Cabernet Franc, almost floral, um, not looking for really big red fruits, but still want you know, people sometimes see the color of these Cabernet Francs and go, it's so light, but also having some power on the palate uh, behind that. So this is mostly 10 plus year old French barrels that it ages in, um, a little bit of stainless steel. Um, but this is sort of one of the styles of Cabernet Franc that you see coming out of the entire region, the Finger Lakes region, this light, fresh, um, just kind of fruit floral, forward Cabernet Franc. I think it's beautiful. I love I love lighter red wines anyway, but this has got real presence in the mouth that you kind of you think, oh, this is going to be ephemeral and just a pretty ephemeral sort of wine. And then you get it in the mouth. It's, oh, there's, there's some substance here. And I just think it's really just intelligent winemaking because, you know, I think the temptation must be, especially in the past when people used to judge wines by their color much more, would be to try and just extract everything out of those skins, you know, just to really come on, you know, let's get everything out of that. There's goodness in those skins. Um, but then you end up losing this, this the, the, you know, the, this is what this wine wants to be, it seems, you know, it's what yeah. those grapes give you. And this is this is a really ethereal, beautiful expression of Cabernet Franc. Yeah, I handle it a bit kind of like I would handle our Pinot Noir as well. And this only does about 14 days on skins. Um, even in 2021 with disease pressure, we saw very little in our Cabernet Franc. Um, so with that, I let it sit for about a day and a half cold. We picked it cold, um, with our machine harvester and then I crushed it up and I didn't inoculate for about a day and a half. Just, I like to cold soak things for some textural extraction, um, and then kind of let it go and let it ferment quite warm, um, sort of low eighties Fahrenheit mm -hmm. and then pressed off, you know, once it was dry, gave it a couple days and then pressed off. So. Yep. Lovely. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, and Cabernet Franc obviously is a very important variety in um, Finger Lakes, and it's quite it's quite hardy, isn't it? I think that's one of the reasons I think it's been popular in Niagara and Canada as well, is because it, it's pretty bomb proof in terms of the winters. Yes, and in comparison to some of the other classic Bordeaux varietals, it performs much better. I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon does pretty well, but it doesn't ripen super well every year. Yeah. So for us with Cabernet Franc, it does well in the winter, it ripens every year, and we can make a lot of rosé is made out of Cabernet Franc, as well as the light bodied Cabernet Franc styles and some bigger, more muscular styles as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> so um, Finger Lakes, fantastic wines. Um, Miguel, Let's turn to um, your wine. Could you introduce your winery for us and then the wines that we're going to taste? Sure. Um, so Ross McCall um, planted uh, the grapes in 1996 um, and he produced the first wine in 2007. So he waited almost 11 years to produce the first wine because he, um, he was not pleased with the quality. He's uh, focusing in and to produce, well, to grow and produce the best wines that land can uh, give you. Um, right now, we have about 44 acres uh, all vinifera, all 100% uh, sustainable. Uh, all the grapes are uh, hand-picked, uh, hand-selected from our own estate. Um, and we have, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay on the whites, uh, and the reds, we have Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Petit Verdot, Syrah. And this year, well, actually last year, we planted uh, one acre of uh, uh, Alborino, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, is, is a grape that has a great potential here in Long Island. Um, I planted the first grapes of Alborino about 15 years ago here in Long Island because uh, I think it's a grape they have great potential to produce uh, uh, delicious wines. Uh, now there's other wineries that find Albarino very successfully. Um, for Ross Michael, it's all about quality. He's not interested to produce quantity. He, If he only produced 200 cases of this specific wine, he's perfectly happy. He doesn't want to produce extra 50 cases more uh, and sacrifice uh, uh, quality. 
Um, and the two wines that we have, um, they are from 2014, which was uh, one of the best uh, years that we have here at Long Island with uh, a hot uh, summer, uh, moderate temperatures at night, which uh, uh, for the Tracian uh, aromas, um, they were lovely. Um, so, um, yeah, that's... Let's, let's begin with the Pinot Noir then. Yep. Well, the Pinot Noir, uh, as you know, is the hard uh, breaking grapes. Uh, you know, the Pinot Noir is very uh, uh, finicky. Even if when you have the best conditions, when you have the best weather, when you have the best soil, sometimes they uh, they don't come the the, the way that you uh, want. Um, but Ross McCall loved uh, Burgundy. He loved Bordeaux wines. He was an importer of um, Grand Cruz from France. And he uh, really wanted to produce the world-class Pinot Noir. So we plant, uh, he planted the Pinot Noir. We have um, uh, multi uh, multiple plants of Pinot Noir, the veneer, some of them ripe earlier, some of them ripe earlier, later. Some of them, they, the clusters they are bigger, some of them they are tighter clusters, smaller berries. Um, and then um, this is a selection of, of the clonals. Uh, the best clonal, the best barrels that uh, they would happen in 2014. Um, to me, it's a, um, it's a combination of, of fruit, oak, well-balanced uh, wine. Um, you can see it's 2014, uh, which uh, um, currently a lot of the wineries are releasing much earlier vintage. Uh, we hold the wines seven, eight, nine years in the bottle. Uh, and until we don't feel that the wines have reached the balance and the perfect uh, taste, uh, we, won't, we won't release the, the wines. It's so is this the current release. release? Yeah, yeah, this is our current release at 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a rich, uh, very pure and fresh uh, strawberry, rubber, um, you know, very nice, uh, well-balanced uh, with a touch of caramel, black tea, a very long finish. Um, the mm -hmm. tannins are very elastic, very soft, and um, yeah, I really uh, love this this wine. And um, like I said, Pinot Noir is is by far one of the most difficult grapes to grow. And yeah. having a wine that uh, is nine years old and it still tastes so fresh is is very uh, very beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have had Pinot Noir down as one of the varieties necessary that would have been the first to choose for growing in Long Island. But this, this is um, a really impressive wine. It's got a, it's got this um, structure. It's got the oak integration, um, and there's still some fruit here. And uh, at age, um, yeah, at, at, at age um, eight and a bit, yeah. Right. Uh, well, it's very textural. And, um, you know, the Pinot Noir, you want to have a wine that have nice uh, balance and, uh, and finesse. And, uh, and to me, this wine really achieved that, all these uh, components. Um, very low yield. We get about one and a half to two tons an acre. All hand pick, we drop leaves, uh, we drop fruit. Uh, we leave one cluster per shoot in order to intensify the concentration of the of the wine. Um, like I said, all hand pick. Um, we only pick in the morning when the fruit is nice and cold. And if we had to stop in the afternoon because the fruit is, is getting hot, we'll stop and we'll continue the, the next day. Um, so, um, so let's yeah. move on to the, the second wine, which yeah. is um, Bob Ben's Blend, Ben's Blend 2014. And this is a sort of more sort of classic sort of Bordeaux style brand, yeah? That's right, yeah. Uh, it's, it has uh, almost equal parts of Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, with a 9% of Petit Verdot. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, you know, is almost the, what had 31% been the maturity of this blend. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon depends on the year. Um, it doesn't ripe uh, properly. But uh, 2014 was uh, a year with moderate temperatures and very long season. And the, the Cabernet Sauvignon got such a nice uh, structure and deep color and intensity and, and fruit that became uh, the majority of this, of this plant. Um, 
is aged at about 50% uh, new oak, uh, and the rest is second year and third year. Uh, each of those grapes are fermented separately, and then the blend uh, comes uh, at the end. Um, you know, you can taste uh, all the different components uh, of the uh, of the wine. Um, you know, the creme de cassis, uh, the mocha, the licorice uh, is very savory. Uh, you know, dry figs uh, and the tannins and the oak are in super well integrated to make the wines last uh, longer in uh, in the aftertaste. Um, yeah, it's quite classic, isn't it? The style is really classic. Um, um, I hate to use the term European, but it's more, it's not a new world style. It's more of a European style. And presumably right. this will develop for quite a bit of time. It's got some, some you know, structure and it's already nicely drinking, but it's it's presumably you could age this for a bit longer as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I totally uh, agree. Um, both of those wines, they still have a nice acidity um, that uh, it will make the wines, uh, you know, age longer. And it stays much fresher. Um, so, um, there's a question Mike Turner's put into the chat. He says, "Can you just repeat at what point you choose the final blend? So, if you ferment everything separately, when do yeah. you decide what's going to go in?" Well, they do some pre-blends. Uh, when you have all those four different wines, you taste each barrel separate because uh, funny enough, you may have a barrel from this producer or a barrel from the other producer that you uh, may think that is good, but it's not good enough to be part of the plan or maybe the oak is very aggressive and uh, maybe becomes part of the other plan. Um, so the blend uh, becomes, uh, well, we do it like a pre-blending. Uh, so to the term, uh, what barrels will be uh, part of the blend and then we do final blend uh, a few months before bottling, and uh, do we do a lot of uh, trial blends in the lab, um, and then we let the wine sit for a couple of days, and then we retaste, and then we decide. Well, maybe the oak is too much. We need to cut down a little bit of the oak, or maybe the oak is not enough. We need to bring more of the heavier, stronger, smoky character onto the wine. Um, but every every grape is uh, harvest separate because they all uh, write uh, different stages and different times of the of the growing season. Uh, being the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Petit Verdot are uh, the last grapes to uh, get ripe and, and harvest. And there's another question from Rene. He says, um, do you grow Bordeaux varieties on different soils fitting to early or late maturity, like in Bordeaux, for example, Merlot on clay, Cabernet Sauvignon on gravels, et cetera? Uh, well, our soil is pretty... Uh, uh, even. Uh, like I said, we are in Ireland, it's pretty flat, uh, very sandy uh, soil. Um, you go deep about three feet down and it's pure sand. Uh, like if you sand, then you can fire at the beach. Um, so uh, the water percolates very fast and quickly. And uh, fortunately, we didn't have the luxury to have different hills that we can grow this specific grape in a different slope facing the north or the south. Um, so, um, but uh, I think our philosophy is to do uh, uh, low yields and, and, and trying to maximize the, uh, the vital uh, character of each individual grape. Mm. Well, it's just turned the hour. So in order to be respectful of people's time who've, who've dialed in, I'll have to unfortunately draw this um, conversation to a close, but I just wanted to thank our three um, participants for such lovely wines and such a beautiful explanations of the influence of water and also um, the influence of place and the way that you make those wines. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for, for tuning in and participating and for all the really good chat that we've had. Um, so I'll hand things back to Katie to close the session. Yeah, Thanks, Amy. thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, panelists. Um, and thank you, attendees, for tuning in once again. Um, hope you enjoyed today's uh, webinar. Um, and just as a reminder, it will be um, it was recorded and it will be published to the YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. So we'll send out a link to all of you participants um, with that recording. And we also hope to see you for the final installment of the series, and that will take place on the 23rd of May, that's a Tuesday, 
um, and that's 2023. So if you haven't registered for that episode, uh, Susanna has dropped the link in the chat to do so. Uh, so thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Bye.